AWS Storage Fundamentals Before we look any deeper into what AWS Storage entails, the first thing it's important to understand is how cloud services work. So say we have all these stations, for example, Singapore, California, Berlin, London, Hong Kong, and Pakistan. Now say that all of these computers wanted some files or objects or whatever to be shared between each other. So what can we do to unify all these systems in different places in such a way where they can have access to all the files they need? Well, one way of doing that is for them to upload their files onto the cloud. So all of them would send their files over to the cloud. So we can see that Singapore sent an MP3 file, so did London. Hong Kong sent a file, so did California. And Pakistan sent an object, and so did Berlin. So now we have two MP3 files, two normal files, and two objects within the AWS cloud. So now when we look at the other side, which is what if we wanted to get some files, now California, Berlin, London, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Pakistan have access to all of the files within the cloud. So say California wanted to download the MP3, they got the MP3. If Berlin wanted the other MP3, they got it. If London and Pakistan wanted the normal files, they got the normal files, and Hong Kong and Singapore got the objects. That's one of the major benefits of working with cloud, is that you have access to all the files from virtually any location in the world. Okay, so now that you have a general understanding of how cloud storage works, let's take a look at the available services we will find within AWS for cloud storage. So under the hood of storage in AWS, you will see these four services. Okay, so now that you have a general understanding of how cloud storage works, let's take a look at the available services we will find within AWS for cloud storage. So under the hood of storage in AWS, you will see these four services. The first one is Elastic File Store. We call that EFS in the shorthand. The second one is Elastic Block Store. We call that one EBS. The third one is called Simple Storage Service, or S3. You may have heard of this one before. It's the most common storage service used within AWS. And the last one is File Service Systems, known as FSX. Though it's important to know what services you will find in AWS for storage, it's also important to know when to use these services. Now say for example, you want to store files. Now to store files, the best services available are EFS and FSX. Say for example, you wanted to store blocks. Blocks are to be stored in EBS. And lastly, if you want to store objects, you would store objects in S3 or Glacier. Simple Storage Service, S3. AWS S3 is a pretty interesting and versatile tool. It's got a lot of use cases associated with it. You can use S3 for archiving, analytics, storage, and backup. Furthermore, you can find a lot of integrations with other AWS services, such as CloudTrail, the key management service that we saw in IAM, AWS Athena, and Storage Gateway. The reason S3 is used so commonly and is such a popular service is because it has many benefits. S3 is extremely cost effective and is really good for hosting. The second benefit of S3 is that it is extremely durable. Apart from that, S3 is highly available and very accessible. These are just some of the things that make S3 such a popular service in the market today. As part of its marketing, AWS says that S3 has unlimited storage. For our use cases, what that basically means is S3 is endlessly scalable. You can keep making it grow to meet your requirements. And making a service grow is much cheaper than having on-premises hardware being bought and set up to do the same. When you're naming your S3 bucket, there's a few things that you need to keep in mind 
Certain naming conventions need to be followed when you are naming your S3 bucket. If these conventions are not followed, your S3 bucket may run into problems. So the first thing you need to keep in mind is that your bucket must be between 3 and 63 characters long. So say you have a bucket called me. You're not going to be able to name your bucket me because it's too short. Now, the second convention you have to follow is that your name can only consist of lowercase letters, numbers, dots, and hyphens. So say you have a name like this, hashtag my S3 hat. You're not going to be able to name your bucket like this. The third naming convention is that your name must begin and end with a letter or a number. So say for example, you have a bucket called forward slash one dot my S3. You will not be able to name your bucket this because it starts with a forward slash. The next convention to be followed is that your S3 bucket must not be formatted as an IP address. So say for example, we name our bucket 192.168.3.4. This is not acceptable and will not be able to be used as a name. Another convention is that your name must not start with the prefix XN. So if you have this bucket called XN dash my bucket, this isn't going to work. So it's going to be denied. The next convention is that your S3 bucket must not end with the suffix dash S3 alias. So say for example, you have a bucket called my bucket dash S3 alias again you're not going to be able to use that. Moving on to the last two points, you need to keep in mind that names need to be unique within the partition. So when you go through your S3, you're going to see that you'll have a bunch of different S3 names, but you will never be able to have two S3 buckets with the same name. And lastly, buckets used with the Amazon S3 transfer acceleration can't have dots in their name. It's a common misconception that files are stored in S3 the same way that we would find them in our computer systems, which is to say that it is assumed that files are stored in S3 in a file hierarchy. This is not the case. Files are not stored in a file hierarchy within S3. Instead, they follow a flat URL namespace where each object has its own unique key. So say, for example, you had a file on your desktop. The way you would locate that file is it would be in a hierarchy. So it would be in C, user, home, desktop, file. However, if you put that same file in an S3 bucket, the way you would locate that file is it would have its own unique URL. So it would have the bucket name s3.amazonaws.com forward slash the unique key assigned to that object. The more common use cases that you would find for Amazon S3 are in the forms of data lake and big data analytics. S3 can create a data lake to hold raw data in its native form, then use machine learning tools, query in place, and analytics to draw insights. S3 works with AWS lake formation to create data lakes, then define governance, security, and auditing policies. Together, they can be scaled to meet your growing data stores, and you'll never have to make an investment upfront. The second use that you will see primarily with S3 is backup and restoration. S3 provides secure and robust backup and restoration solutions. S3 storage classes. So what are storage classes in Amazon S3? Well, these are different classes of storage that you can use depending on how frequently you want to access your data. So say if you wanted to access your data a lot, then the S3 standard works perfectly for you. However, if you do not want to access your data frequently and plan to have an archive set up in an S3, then S3 Glacier or S3 Glacier Deep Archive are better options for you. And so, Depending on your frequency and some other factors, you can decide which S3 bucket is best for you. 
you will often find that S3 intelligent tiering is used to make sure that you aren't overpaying for the use of any bucket, so that the moment certain access policies are met, the bucket is shifted from one to the other. As you move towards more infrequent access in these storage classes, the cost for storing data in each different type of class decreases. So the most expensive way to store data would be to use the S3 standard, because that one costs $0.021 per GB. And the cheapest option would be S3 Glacier Deep Archive, because that costs $0.00099 per GB. At this point, you might be thinking, well, I, I should just put my resources with a deep glacier. It's going to cost me the least. However, you have to keep in mind that S3 Glacier Deep Archive can only be accessed within certain hours. You cannot have ready access to something like this. And so a better option is to go for S3 Intelligent Tiering. Because as your access patterns change, your buckets are adjusted accordingly. Managing objects in your S3, such that they are stored effectively throughout their lifecycle, is managed by the storage lifecycle configuration. There are two types of actions that define when the configuration will act upon the objects. The first is transition actions, which are the actions that define when objects transition to another storage class. Take this demo for example, and assume we have an object in our S3 standard bucket. We want for our object to move into the S3 standard infrequent access bucket after 30 days of its creation, and then after another 30 days to put that object into an S3 glacier. The second type of action is the expiration action that defines when an object is to expire. S3 will delete the objects that have met the expiration policy. In our example, 465 days after its creation, the object will be deleted. This is how you can effectively manage objects using S3 lifecycle configuration and policies. Now we're going to take a look at how we can set storage classes within our S3 buckets. So what we're going to do now is we're going to run through a demo where I will be showing you how you can create an S3 bucket, upload an object within that bucket, and set the storage class for that object in the bucket. After that, we're going to take a look at data lifecycle policies and how you can make one and set one on your objects. Okay, so let's see how we can access storage classes within S3 in our AWS. So the first thing we're going to have to do, of course, is we could create a bucket separate from all the buckets we already have existing because I don't want to mess over my workspaces. So what we can do is call it skill curb dash demo dash storage dash classes. That should be fine. And we can just go ahead and create this bucket. Oops, I can just call this zero. And it's just gonna create this bucket for me really quickly. Then we can go ahead and look at our storage classes. Yep, there we go. So now we can go ahead and move into our bucket. So what we have to do from here is we have to upload our files. So we can just add a file here really quickly so say that I have these meeting notes, for example. So I'm just going to add these meeting notes right here. So now when I have these notes, I'm going to select that file that I uploaded and move down into properties. Now, when I go into the properties, it's going to show me all the storage classes that I discussed previously. So we have standard intelligent Turing, standard infrequent access, one zone infrequent access. And then we have two different forms of glacier. One is instant retrieval and one is flexible retriever. And that one was actually the old glacier, as many of you may know it. And then moving on, we have Glacier Deep Archive and Reduced Redundancy. Of course, as we discussed previously, moving from frequency to archive access, your cost goes down. So your standard would cost the most, your intelligent tiering would cost a little less, and moving on, so on, so forth, all the way down to here, which would be the cheapest. There's other factors in play as well when it comes to cost. So you have minimum billable object size within a bunch of them. You have the monitoring fees, which only applies to intelligent tiering because that's the one that's actually looking at your objects to see how frequently they're being accessed. And then you have retrieval fees because when you have to get things out of an archive, 
it tends to be quite the process and it's a little costly. So they tend to charge you per GB. So what we're going to do now is we're going to set our object up with intelligent tiering. So that way we can even look at data life cycles. So with that, now that we've set it up, we can just go ahead and upload it. And once it's uploaded, it's a really small file, 272 bytes. Yep, it's uploaded and that's done. And now we have our file here. So let's go back to our bucket. When we come back to our bucket now, we can go over into our properties. And now we can see that we have intelligent tiering archive configurations. We're gonna use this today to set up a configuration that allows us to move our meeting notes into archives as time moves on. So we want to move our notes after a set amount of time into archive access. And then after that, we want to move it into a deeper archive access after another set amount of time. So we can go ahead and create a configuration here and we can call it my configuration one. Why not? We can give it the prefix skill curb. And as we move down, now we have these two archive rule actions that we discussed in our data lifecycle policy section, where we have archive access tier and deep archive access tier. So there's a, there's small descriptions associated with both of these. So let's read them out. When enabled, intelligent tiering will automatically move objects that haven't been accessed for a minimum of 90 days to the archive access tier. So that means that if you have not touched your meeting notes for 90 days, AWS is going to assume, okay, you don't want to use this frequently. You're not going to use it. So I'm going to move this into an archive access tier because it's cheaper to keep it there. So we're just going to check that. And then we have to set the number of days until the transition is made to the archive access tier. So the minimum number you can put here is 90 days. And it says so at the bottom here. So the whole number greater than or equal to 90 and up to 730 days. So we're just going to set this at 90. Now, say we wanted to move our meeting notes deeper into the deep archive. So to do that, we also have to select this one here. Now, in deep, deep archive, the whole number has to be greater than or equals to 180 days. And 180 days would apply at the same time as archive access tier. So when you've moved into archive access tier and you've set your deep archive to 180 days, now it's another 90 days of not accessing those meeting notes until those are moved into your deep archive access tier. So now we want to set this value at the minimum available, which is 180. So I'm just going to set this at 180 and I'm just going to create this configuration. There we go. So now we have a configuration made ready to go. And as you can see here, days until transition to archive access, 90 days, days until transition to deep archive access tier, 180 days. And with this, we've sort of explored the storage classes available within Amazon S3. And we've also seen how intelligent tiering works and how data lifecycle can be managed and created. Elastic File System, or EFS. So what is EFS? Well, EFS is the file storage service that we associate or use with EC2. The service is optimized for lower latency access than you would find on other storage types. It follows a pay-per-use model, which is to say that there is no sign-up cost, there is no minimum fee, and you only pay for what you use. One of the beauties of EFS is that it can be hooked up to a number of EC2s. So you can have one EFS set up with your global files that you know that you will use across multiple EC2s and have multiple EC2s linked to that EFS and access those files from there. The file manager interface and the semantics are very similar to what you would find on your own computer. So using EFS is pretty simple. It's going to be very familiar to your Windows operating system or your Macintosh or your Linux. EFS is commonly used in the following scenarios. Lift and shift application support. EFS is elastic available, and scalable. It enables you to move enterprise applications easily and quickly without needing to re-architect them. EFS enables analytics for big data. It has the ability to run big data applications 
which demands significant node throughput, low latency file access, and read after write operations. And lastly, EFS is really useful for content management systems and web server support. EFS is a robust throughput file system capable of enabling every content management out there. So say you wanted to create your website in WordPress or Joomla, EFS is the way you would go. Elastic Block Store, or EBS. Let's take a look at what EBS is. EBS is used to store persistent data. What does that mean? The easiest way to explain EBS is to think of it like a computer hard drive. You only keep the files and, well, blocks in our case, on EBS that you really want to retain, no matter what happens. So even if you stop using it, your data is still there. That is what we call persistent data. EBS is especially useful if you need high availability, low latency, as well as certain input-output operations per second. We call those IOPS. EBS volumes are dynamically managed, which means that you can dynamically change the configuration of a volume attached to an instance. A single EBS volume can only be associated with a single EC2 instance. However, the same EC2 instance could have multiple EBS volumes associated with it. When it comes to the type of storage available to your EBS, you have primarily two choices. You can either go with the solid state drive, that we call an SSD, or a hard disk drive, which is known as an SSD. So let's see the differences between these two to figure out which one is better suited to our purposes. So a hard drive is between 99.8 to 99.9% .9 durable. You can have capacities between 125 gigs to 16 terabytes. You can perform between 250 to 500 IOPS per second with a hard drive. And your maximum throughput per volume is between 250 to 500 megabits per second. Moving over to our SSD, the durability goes significantly higher. So it's between 99.8 to 99.999% durability. You can have storages between 1 GB all the way up to 64 terabytes. You can have 16,000 all the way up to 256,000 IOPS for this volume. You have a maximum throughput per volume between 250 to 4,000 megabytes per second, depending on the type of SSD storage volume you've selected. Though this seems pretty confusing on the top of it, and it doesn't really make a lot of sense, Let's associate these to their use cases so that we can better understand which is used where. We would use the SSD in low latency interactive apps and development and test environments. It would be used in workloads that require sub millisecond latencies, sustained IOPS performance, and input output intensive database workloads. Moving over to hard drives, these volume types are more used where data has to just stay there and not really do much of anything. So it's more used in scenarios of big data, data warehousing, log processing, throughput oriented storage for data that is infrequently accessed, and scenarios where the lowest storage cost is important. You will see Elastic Block Store applied in the following use cases. The first one is testing and development. You can scale, archive, duplicate, or provision your testing, development, or production environments using Elastic Block Store. Moving on to relational databases. EBS scales to meet your changing storage needs. This makes it a great choice for deploying databases, including PostgreSQL, MySQL, Oracle, or Microsoft SQL Server. NoSQL databases. EBS offers NoSQL databases the low latency performance and dependability they need for peak performance. And lastly, business consistency. You can copy EBS snapshots over, and this allows you to maintain 
accurate records for your business. Okay, so now we're gonna host a static website in an S3 bucket on our AWS and see how we need to go about doing that. The way we're gonna do this is going to be in a series of very simple steps. And at the end, we should see our static website hosted in an S3 bucket. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create an S3 bucket. Then we're going to place our site in our bucket. After that, we are going to allow public access so that we can access our website. And then we're going to visit this website via index.html. Lastly, when we're done with our site, we're going to delete the bucket that we created for this demo. Okay, so let's get started and see how we can set up our S3 bucket before we can do anything else. So to set up an S3 bucket, the first thing you have to do is head over to your AWS console, like so. Once you're in your AWS management console, from here you have to go to your S3. Once that loads up, we're going to see how we can create a bucket for our project. Perfect, so now that our S3 is loaded up, we can actually see that we already have three buckets in here. We don't want to use any of the buckets that pre-exist. We're going to create a new bucket for our demo site. So what we're going to do is just you're going to see the button here that says create bucket. So we're going to go ahead and click that bucket. We're just going to set up a new bucket. So we can call this my dash skill curb dash demo dash bucket so that we know that this is the bucket we've allocated for our demonstration. Once we've done that, we don't need to change any of these settings now. We can move on and create our bucket. This can take a few seconds, so I'm going to pause it here and come back when it's done. Once your bucket is created, you will see this green message on the top that told you that you have successfully created your bucket, my skill curb demo bucket, and you should see it in your list of buckets here. Now, what you have to do from here is you have to go inside your bucket and now you'll see that there is nothing inside your bucket. So from here, what you have to do is you will see this button on the right side that says upload. You'll need to upload your files from here. Now, my website is ready to go in this folder right here. So let me bring that up and show that to you guys. So this is our website right here. This is a template that I got online. So that's what we will be using to set up our static website today. So what I can do is I can just select all of these files here and drag it and drop it into here. And that is basically all you have to do. And once you've done that, you can just upload and it'll upload your files for you. You should note that if you have a lot of files in small sizes, that this process may take a longer time. However, since we don't have that many files right now, this shouldn't take more than a minute. I'll be back when this has done uploading. Okay, now everything that we had to upload to our bucket has been uploaded. Since we don't need this anymore, I'm just gonna go ahead and close that and maximize this page. So you can see that all of the files that we had to upload to our bucket have been uploaded. So we can close this and go back to our S3 bucket. And there we go. We can see that the folders are coming in nicely along with everything else that we need for this bucket. Now what we need to do is make sure that this is publicly accessible. The way we're going to do that is we have to go into permissions. Now when you go into permissions, you'll see that you'll have this green tick here, which says that all public access has been blocked. We don't want this to be the case, so we need to edit this. And we need to uncheck this box that says block all public access. So we uncheck that box. Make sure no boxes here are ticked either, and then we save the changes. And once you do that, because this is generally a dangerous setting that they don't want you to do, they want you to confirm the settings manually. And you have to do that by writing confirm. So we're just going to do that and confirm. And once that's done, you'll see the successfully edited block public access settings for this bucket message show up on the top. Now, when you come back, you'll see the block all public access is off, but it doesn't end there. We also need to set a bucket policy. So you'll see this button here that says edit. We need to go here. Perfect. So now that we're here, there's one thing we have to do. 
which is that we need to allow the get object to work here. So when you go to filter services, you can just write S3. And once you have the S3 actions, once they load up, we can look for get object. There we go. So now we have allowed get object and And now we can go ahead and try to save these changes. It's going to give you an error at the bottom. And the API response is going to be that you need the field principle to have something in it before you can save the settings. So what we're going to do is we're going to go over to principle here. And we're just going to put this little field here. Of course, we need those brackets. And so we're going to put those there. And now what this does is it tells AWS basically that I'm hosting a website in this S3 bucket. And so it's going to manage itself accordingly. However, we're still not done here because we've left this resource empty. So if we go ahead to try to save these changes, it's going to give us a new error. Here we go. So now you can see that it says that the action does not apply to any res resources in the statement. And so what we have to do now is we have to go ahead and give it the resource. So we can remove these brackets and we can take the bucket ARN from here. So now we have our bucket ARN, but it doesn't stop here because this is just the bucket. We haven't specified any resources yet. The resources are all the objects within the bucket. So we would say that forward slash star to apply this to all the objects inside the bucket. And when we've done that, we can save these changes and it should save successfully. Now, once we've done that, we can go back to our objects and we can head over to our index.html. So if we get in the object URL, we can just click our object URL here and it should open up as a website for us. And there we go. So it's loading up. Of course, this may take longer than just dry running it on your local machine because of course it takes the resources from the bucket and so that resource can take some time to load. And now we're in our website. So as you can see, this is a really basic website. It's just a static website, a template really. And it's just here to show you how we can set up our bucket. We have a bunch of nice pictures and animations here. While well I'm making it this far, this is from Show Abe. Congrats on setting up your S3 website. It's me. And this is how you would set up a static website in your S3 bucket. So now that you've set up your website, say that you just wanted to do this for demonstration purposes the same way I'm doing it today. So what we can do is we can simply go back to our AWS and get this bucket taken down and deleted. So let's go back to our AWS and see how we can do that. Okay, so here we are back in our S3 management panel and we can see all of our s3 buckets our buckets right here and now we're done with our website so we just want to take it down and get rid of the bucket so it's really simple the first thing we have to do is we have to click on this bucket and we have to empty out the contents so if you click this button here it'll ask you do you want to permanently delete all the objects in this bucket and since we do we have to write permanently delete in this field here. So I'm just going to write that down permanently delete. There we go. And once you do that, it shouldn't take too long for it to delete or completely empty out all the contents inside your bucket. As we can see, there's a status bar here and yep, it's gone. And now this bucket is completely empty. We can confirm this by visiting our bucket and seeing what's inside. So let's see what it gets when it loads objects. Nothing. It has no objects. We've emptied it out. And so we can go back and now we can go ahead and we can delete this bucket. So to delete the bucket, it's going to confirm with you whether or not you actually want to delete this bucket. And to do that, you would have to write the name. So we can just copy the name over from up there and paste it down there and we can delete the bucket. And there we go. Your bucket has now been deleted and we should be seeing the original three buckets that we saw the first time we came into the Amazon S3 management panel. Yep, there we go. So this was a simple demonstration on how you can set up a static website using Amazon S3.